as we dive into the message, um, I have a question. I want to find out here who has been married the longest, who's presently married right now, because I've got a little something here. Um, who has been married so far 55 consecutive years? Anybody? Okay, in the back. Okay, over here. Anybody else? I see hands over there. Okay, so we've got a group here. Okay, who has been married 60 years so far? Anybody? Over here, okay, 60. Okay, let's go 65. Anybody 65? 64? 63. Okay, 63. Congratulations. Well, I don't, uh, I don't uh, know you that well yet. I don't think I've met you yet. But, um, well, I've got two things for you. Okay, I'm going to give you this first of all, and I don't want you to show it to anybody else. But I want you to look inside here and just tell me what your first impressions are of this. <laughs> well, you have, to look, uh, you have to check and find out. <laughs> so, for those of you who want to know, it's a beautiful, empty pot of dirt. No plant. <laughs> Actually, I do have something for you, and happy 60, was 63 years? Yes. Congratulations, and enjoy a date out on behalf of us. <laughs> now, I'm going to leave this up here, because this actually plays into what we're talking about this morning. This empty pot filled with dirt, with no flour in it. And it centers us around a question this morning that I want us to think about. How does it feel to you when you're given a half-hearted honor? Where there's a gift that's given to you and uh, there is maybe no thought put into it. Where you look at the gift that you're given and you think clearly this is just an afterthought where the person didn't really care. Where rather than this gift being something that's exciting to give, where the person wants to know something that you'll enjoy and you'll love, it was clearly an imposition. And my question for you this morning is, do we ever do that to God? Do we ever come to God with the gifts of ourselves, the gifts of our talents, our abilities, our skills, the gifts of all the things he's given us? And do we hold back and do we give a half-hearted honor? I got to ask you this morning, why are you here? Why are you at church this morning? Is it out of obligation this morning? Is it because you have to be? Or is it out of indifference this morning? Or is it out of a place of misplaced motivation? So one thing I want to be clear about this morning is that everything we do here on Sunday morning, everything we do as a church, whether it be singing, whether it be praying, whether it be reading the word together, whether it be studying it, whether it be having our small groups, whether it be doing community stuff like our warming center, whether it be doing U18 stuff and youth during the midweek, everything we do that we strive to do here, we do for a central purpose. And it's because we believe as a church, as a church body together, as a community, and as individuals, we are called as a church to honor God with the best that we have. That we are called to bring God our best and honor him as the church community. But beyond that, as a church, do you know that today, that your whole life, that Every moment of your life, your dreams, your desires, your skills and your abilities, your priorities and your pleasures, your vocation and recreation, your relationships, every aspect of your life this morning, your whole life, God has given you as a gift of love to you, and he longs for you to give it back to him and honor him with the best of your life and everything you have. So whether it comes to what we do here on a Sunday morning or what you do in your own private life, and how you live in your everyday lives. The question is, do we give God the afterthoughts and the easy leftovers? Does honoring God with who we are, does it consume us? Or does it just 
take a convenient position when we have time. I want to give you the key idea this morning. It's this. That God says, I want you. I want your heart. We're talking in the book of Malachi, and the theme that's central in the book of Malachi this morning is this idea of return, where God calls his people to return to me, and I will return to you. And God, what you got to hear this morning is God, in the most perfect sense of the word possible, is jealous for you this morning. He is jealous for your heart. He's jealous for your love. He's jealous for your affections. He loves you very, very much more than words can describe. And he is longing in love for you to come to him and give him your heart and your affections. God is longing for you to worship and honor him from a place in your heart where there's a drive to honor and worship him, where that is your motivation where you're driven to be here on a Sunday morning because of that motivation, and where you're motivated to live your everyday life in the ordinary boring moments and in the extra, extraordinary moments with a central driving force that you love God, that you love Jesus so much that you naturally want to honor him with everything you have. God this morning isn't seeking forced or obligated or indifferent leftovers. He isn't seeking empty words and affections this morning. He is seeking you. And he's seeking you fully engaged because you love him so much. I'm going to invite you to turn your Bibles, if you have them, to Malachi chapter 1. We're going to pick up in verse 6. So I'll invite you to turn to Malachi chapter 1, verse 6. As you're flipping there, like I said, we are continuing in our series in the book of Malachi together. And in a nutshell, Malachi is a message from God through the prophet Malachi to the people of Israel. And it's a message of return. You see, the people of Israel, God's special nation, his special people, had walked away from their closeness with God. And the devotion and joy that once characterized the relationship was not there. And I described the setting a lot more last week. If you want to go back and listen to that again, I invite you to, because I'm not going to unpack that all again this morning. It was quite lengthy. But please go back and listen to the message from last week on our podcast or on YouTube as well through our website. But what I will say is that the people of Israel were living in a place of shattered hopes, shattered dreams, and unmet expectations. And like I said last week, they had spent decades being exiled to Babylon. In fact, Judah, which was the southern kingdom, which was the last to go, spent from the years 587 to 538 BC, 49 years in captivity, in exile. And in that time, the land that was theirs, the land that marked them as God's special people that God had promised them was taken away. And with their land being taken away, the temple, which was the central location where the worship of God happened, this place where the presence of God came and filled in this amazing way where they personally met with God and offered sacrifice, it was destroyed. And these pieces, the temple and the land, showed that God had chosen them to be his specific nation. But these specific pieces that gave them identity, these specific pieces that gave them security were gone. The temple was destroyed, the land was gone, and they were in captivity, and they felt hopeless. But as they were given freedom, as King Cyrus in 538 declared them free, and they could go back to their home, there was a sense of hope. There was a sense of expectation. And they came into the land with this expectation that they were going to rebuild. And in that time, there was prophecy that was given in which they took to interpret that God was going to bless their land in the present and make it even better and bigger than it was before. Yet here's the thing, they didn't understand the prophecies that were given. They didn't understand the future perspective to them. Like I said last week, these prophecies were messianic, meaning that they were tied directly into the coming of the Messiah, the coming of Jesus. And because they misunderstood the prophecies, instead of joy, there quickly became sorrow. Instead of hope, there quickly became despair. And in, and in that setting of despair and sorrow, uh, there crept an apathy towards God. There crept in a complacency and an aimlessness towards how they viewed him personally. And as a result, what happened is they strayed. They walked away from God, and they walked away from that closeness that they once enjoyed with God, where they enjoyed his physical presence in their lives, especially in the temple worship. And they walked away from this closeness where they wanted to honor and they wanted to follow him. And they pursued themselves. They didn't pursue obedience to God. And their relationship with God was as his people it had grown stale. 
Their relationship with God as his people had grown empty, and it had grown removed. And the message of the prophet Malachi is that God longed for his people to return to him so that they could experience his presence returning to them as well. You see, he loved them very much. And he longed for nothing more than their affections and their hearts. You know, the book of Malachi asked us two questions this morning. And we looked at the first one last week. We looked at this idea of how has God loved you? The first part of Malachi unpacks this idea, how has God loved you? And last week we looked at how God says, I have loved you. And the people said, how have you loved us? And God unpacked that for them. And foundational to the whole book of Malachi, we have to have this theme that God loves his people. And God speaks because he loves his people. But out of that question, how has God loved you, comes the next question that basically consumes the rest of the book. How have you loved God? How have you loved God? And as we're going to look at this week, the people had to answer this second question. They had to answer the question of how have they loved God as God called to account how they were honoring him in their worship or lack thereof. I want to read for you Malachi chapter 1, starting in verse 6. And here's how it reads for us this morning. A son honors his father, and a servant his master. But if I am a father, where is my honor? And if I am a master, where is your fear of me? Says the Lord of armies to you priests who despise my name. Yet you ask, how have we despised your name? By presenting defiled food on my altar. How have we defiled you, you ask, when you say, when you say the Lord's table is contemptible? When you present a blind animal for sacrifice, is it not wrong? And when you present a lame or sick animal, is it not wrong? Bring it to your governor. Would he be pleased with you or show you favor? Asks the Lord of armies. And now, plead for God's favor. Will he be gracious to us? Since this has come from your hands, will he show any of you favor? Asks the Lord of armies. I wish one of you would shut the temple doors so that you would no longer kindle a useless fire on my altar. I am not pleased with you says the Lord of armies. And I will accept no offering from your hands. First point this morning is this. Worship. It's an all or nothing event. Now this passage that we're looking at is addressed to the priests, okay? It's addressed to the ones who were responsible for managing the worship that happened in the temple. So basically a modern day equivalent would be the pastors and the worship leaders is who this was addressed to. And God says to them, he says, guess what guys? I am in a position of honor over you. I am almighty over you. I am the one who is, who is over in power, who is greater than you, but you aren't honoring me. I'm the one who's in that position of honor, yet you can't offer me honor. And he calls himself here, as through the rest of the book of Malachi, this phrase, the Lord of armies, or some translations say the Lord of hosts, or the Lord Almighty. And the image here is of a commander. The image here is of, in that military context, of a commander-in-chief who is high and exalted over all the troops, over all the armies. And what God is doing here by calling himself the Lord of armies, the Lord of hosts, the Lord Almighty, is he's saying that I have authority and position over everything and over you priests. And the priests would have known this. The priests would have seen the hand of God at work in the history of their nation. They knew who God was and that he was almighty. They knew that he was the God who delivered them out of the hand of Egypt. But before that, that he was the God who actually made them into a nation. That he promised to a guy named Abraham that he'd have offspring. And at the age of 100, Abraham has a son. That was God at work. That was God Almighty at work. They knew that 400 years later that this nation would grow into a big group of people and they'd need to be exiled out of, or need to be given an exodus out of slavery from 
Egypt. And that was done by the almighty hands of God who brought plagues and famine, all sorts of disaster upon the people of Egypt to let them know that he was in charge of everything, that he was almighty over Pharaoh. And God showed his hand there. God showed his hand as they had wandered in the desert and as they had crossed over the Jordan River and as he provided for them and as they were in the promised land, how he sent the enemies fleeing and with a small little army that they sent massive nations to flight. And they would have known that throughout Israel's history that when God was on their side and God Almighty was fighting for them, it didn't matter how many people they had, that they were guaranteed the victory even in the face of impossible odds because God is undefeated. They knew this. They knew who God was. They knew that this was the Almighty God. Yet he says, you guys aren't honoring me at all. Instead, you are despising or you are holding contempt, in contempt, my name. And this word contempt in the, actual, in the original Hebrew, this word baza, it means so much more than just contempt. It means to despise, to regard with contempt, to be despicable, to be vile, worthless. And this is how they were treating God and treating his worship. Now, there's a common word in this passage. It appears six different times from verse 6 to 14. It's this word, name. God throws the word name in there time and time again. And when God speaks about his name, he's not just speaking about his first name. He's not just saying, hey, I am, or my name is Yahweh God. This is who I am. He's speaking beyond just a name. He's speaking about his honor. He's speaking about his reputation. And he's saying to them, he says, you are taking my honor that is reserved for me. You're taking my reputation that only I can hold. And he says, you're taking my identity by how I have revealed myself to you and by what I have called myself to you. And what you're doing is you're taking my name and my honor and my identity and you're making it absolutely worthless. You're making it despicable. You're making it hated. You see, God takes his honor seriously. And when he calls the people on that, when he calls the priests on it, their answer isn't one of humility. It isn't, uh, oh God, we're so sorry. How are we doing this? How are we not honoring you? How are we taking your name and defiling it? No, it's spoken in arrogance. And these priests, much like they did in the earlier part of the chapter where God says, I have loved you, and says, what do you mean, how have you loved us? Here, in arrogance, they're saying, how have we despised your name? Come on, God. How's that, how's that happening? How have we made your name worthless and vile? How have we stained your reputation? And what God says in response, he says, I have a standard that I am worthy of. Yet you are not giving me your best and all in worship and honor of me. You're not giving me the best. You're not giving me the all. In fact, when it comes to the offerings and sacrifices that you are bringing... What you're doing is you're bringing me the leftovers. You're bringing me the scraps that nobody else wants. And in doing so, what you're doing is you're making the altar, the pure altar where these offerings are to be offered. Is you're making this altar where you worship me and where you offer these sacrifices and offerings, you're making this altar worthless, meaningless, and hated. You see, in those days, pre-Jesus, uh, sacrifice, animal sacrifice, was a major part of the life of the nation in the worship of God. Sacrifice was a requirement that was needed to deal with sin. That when you sinned, you had to offer sacrifice to kind of make restitution for that. But beyond that, sacrifice was a major form of worship. It was also offered as a sign of thankfulness. So if you were thankful for your crops, for example, that you grew that year, you would offer a sign of thankfulness by presenting some of your crops unto God. Or if you were thankful, you might bring some of your animals from your fold, and you would offer them as a sacrifice of thankfulness. You'd also offer a sacrifice of dependence, showing your need for God. And we find out through the Old Testament time and time again, where when the people prayed and sought the face of God and said, God, we need your wisdom, they offered a sacrifice along with it. And we also see time and time again in the, New, in the Old Testament where people would offer sacrifice simply as a sign of closeness and belonging to God. Now the reason why we don't do that anymore is because of Jesus. Because through his death and his new life, he became our sacrifice. But back then they were still under this old system. And a, requir a requirement of the system, the sacrificial system, was that any animal that was offered had to be the firstborn male of the herd. It had to be the firstborn male. 
But beyond that, it had to be without physical defect. And if you want to find proof of that, you just need to go to Leviticus chapter 1 through chapter 7, or Leviticus 22 verse 20, or Deuteronomy 15 21. God didn't accept any less than perfection. Any less than perfection was wrong in God's eyes. And when we read this verse, in verse 8, it says, when you presented a blind animal for sacrifice, is it not wrong? Or, and when you present a lame or sick animal, is it not wrong? The word wrong doesn't quite cover how God viewed it. In fact, he uses this Hebrew word ra, which means injurious, which is looking up what these words mean. Injurious means maliciously insulting, libelous, causing or likely to cause damage or harm. So it's injurious. It's also wicked. It's displeasing. And then throw in this word malignant, which means hostile, full of hate, poisonous, cruel, evil intentioned. And that's how God viewed their sacrifices. That's how God viewed it when they came to the temple and they offered these sacrifices that were defective, that were sick and dying and weren't up to God's standard. And this is how God viewed their sacrifices. And the thing is, is that they knew it full well. The priests knew that, that, that there was a standard that they had to adhere to. The priests knew the law of Moses was handed down some 1,000 years earlier where God instituted what he expected in his sacrifice. And this is why God calls them out. It wasn't just a, a simple mistake. They knew it was wrong. And God goes as far as to say, look, you know it's wrong, and you wouldn't even do this to the governor of your nation. You see, back then, Israel, while well, had been freed from Babylon and from Persia, which had taken over the Babylonian Empire, they weren't their own country again. They were still a state, and they were under Persian control, and they had a governor who was over them, who they paid tribute to. And he says, you wouldn't even pay your governor this tribute. You wouldn't give him this defective offering. You wouldn't give him the defective animals. So why do you think you should give it to me? And he's asking them, why do they think that they should give to God, who is the Lord of armies, who is over all governors and chiefs, something so evil that they wouldn't even give to their governor? And one commentator I was reading this week said that they were more fearful of the governor than the one who sat over every governor and ruler on earth. Now, God wanted worship, and he wanted honor that was either all or none. He didn't want this half in between stuff. And he wanted the best from them. He want, and the best was the very least that he deserved. And if they couldn't give him that, he wanted none of it. And he told them that he would rather than accept the mediocre gifts, he would rather that the temple be shut altogether and that the worship would cease and there'd be no more sacrifices and offerings offered. He would rather that happen than them come in and placate him by giving him a half-hearted honor. Anything but the best, according to verse 10, was worthless. And they were just creating a, they were just kindling a fire for nothing. And he didn't want it. So his response to them was, if they couldn't give him the best, then they may as well go home and stop wasting their time and shut the doors. I'm going to keep reading in verse 11. Here's how it reads. My name will be great among the nations, from the rising of the sun to its setting. Incense and pure offerings will be presented in my name in every place, because my name will be great among the nations, says the Lord of armies. Second thought this morning is this, is that worship, God longs for people who honor him. And this is an interesting verse here. Verse 11 is interesting because God does two things in this small verse. First thing he does is he defends his honor and he defends his reputation. And in this verse alone, in verse 11, he mentions this phrase name three times. He mentions his name. It's important and he wants it to be mentioned. He wants people to notice it. And he states that as the Lord of armies, as the commander in chief, that he, that his name, that his reputation will be great among all peoples. That his name, his reputation will be worshipped. And all people of all nations will honor him with right, pure, and proper offerings and sacrifices because his name and his reputation is so worthy of it. So he defends his honor and reputation. 
But he does something else here too. He speaks to his desire to have people who want to worship him. And this word in chapter 11 is actually, or in verse 11 is actually a prophetic word for the future. And Malachi is speaking of a day where through Jesus Christ, through his death and through his resurrection, what would happen is the curtain that existed in the temple, the curtain that separated the very presence of God, the holy presence of God, and kept people out, that it would be ripped in half, and the presence of God would no longer be contained in this room, but it would be spread to all nations. And that whether you were a priest or not, whether you were a Jew by birth or by blood, or whether you were a Gentile from some other nation, that because the temple curtain would be ripped in half, that Jesus and the worship of God be accessible to all nations. And what he's saying here is that he's longing for this day where all nations will bring him honor, where all nations will bring him praise. And he's speaking prophetically into the future. And what he's saying here is that I want your worship and I deserve your worship because I love you. But if you are going to worship me with your half-hearted and leftover scraps of offerings that not even your governor will take, then I will find for me a people that will. I will go to those who you right now call unclean, those Gentiles that you don't want to have anything to do with. I will go to the Samaritans and whomever else, and I will go to the other nations, and I will go to them, to, and I will seek their worship. And guess what? They will love me, and they will honor me, and they will worship me. He says, why? Because I am the Lord of armies. I am the Almighty who is unmatched, and I am worthy of it. I'm going to keep reading in verse 12 here. Here's how it reads, starting verse 12. But you are profaning it when you say, the Lord's table is defiled, and its product, its food, is contemptible. You also say, look, what a nuisance, and you scorn it, says the Lord of armies. You bring stolen, lame, or sick animals. You bring this as an offering. Am I to accept that from your hands, asks the Lord? The deceiver is cursed, who has an acceptable male in his flock, and makes a vow, but sacrifices a defective animal to the Lord. For I am a great king, says the Lord of armies, and my name will be feared among the nations." Last thought is this, worship, it's not a meaningless obligation. God, through Malachi, circles back to the people staining and polluting the purity of the altar on which the offerings and sacrifices were altered. He says that the altar is stained, it's dirty, and the food offered on it is completely worthless. But beyond them doing that, beyond them bringing these faulty animals He says, there's something else that you guys have been doing. He says, you guys are saying that worshiping me is just a nuisance. That it's just another obligation you have to do. It's something you're growing tired of. It's a hardship and it's a complete waste of time. And because it was such an obligation or waste of time for them, they had no motivation to honor God in the way he deserved. Because their hearts weren't there, they didn't want to do it in the way that he deserved. And because they didn't want to be there, they didn't put their heart into it. And as a result, what they did is they brought these injured, they brought these sick and these stolen and lame animals. And God was not interested in accepting these offerings. And the reason why is because they had better. And they knew better. You see, they didn't offer sickly and dying animals because they had no other option. It wasn't because they had nothing left and this is the best of what they had. It's actually believed that Darius of Persia sent the people with more than enough livestock to offer sacrifice. And they had the animals they needed to be supplied for. But the thing is, they just didn't want to. The good animals that they could use were worth too much to themselves. And they cost too much for them to sacrifice. They didn't want to do it. And the implication here is that the priests wanted cheap religion that didn't cost them anything. They didn't want something that was going to cost them and cause them a sacrifice. And verse 14 talks about this a bit more. It talks about this one who is cursed, who has an acceptable animal in their flock, and is under a vow to God to present it, but instead they bring a defective animal. God curses that person who gives the very least out of obligation because they do not want it to cost them. And he calls it the priests who are cheating the system. 
And he calls them out for cheating the system for their own benefit and doing what they think is the bare minimum out of meaningless obligation. Yet what we've seen this morning is that worship is an all or none event. That God longs for people who honor him with their lives, with everything they have. And that worship is not a meaningless obligation. The key idea, once again, this morning is that God says, I want you. I want your heart. So this morning, I need to ask you this question. Do you need to come back to God in your worship, in how you honor him? See, God loves you today, and he longs for your heart today. He wants you to worship him and give him your affections and give him your honor. He wants you. You know, we've been talking a lot as a church lately about being a Jesus-driven church. We've been talking about how this is central to our vision and our direction as a church. And as we've been thinking about being a Jesus-driven church and how that affects our worship, I need to ask this morning, where's your heart at? Do you love God and do you want to honor him? When we come together as a church, where's your heart at? You know, of course, I'm talking about Sunday morning. That is a part of it. We do need to ask, why do you come on Sunday morning? What is your motivation? Are you here because you have to? Are you here because your spouse is dragging you here and you have no choice? Are you here because, well, if I don't, you have guilted yourself into thinking that something bad might happen to you? Like, what's your motivation? Why are you here? Or are you here this morning because you want to, because you want to spend time with God and you want to honor God? And when you come here on Sunday mornings, what's your attitude like? Are you coming begrudgingly? Are you coming half-hearted? Or are you coming wanting to give God your best and spend time in his presence and love him and experience his love? Now, like I said earlier, worshiping and honoring God is so much more than what we do on Sunday mornings. Worship actually starts on Monday morning each week. And it builds to what we do here on Sunday morning. What we do here on Sunday morning has to be a reflection of how you live your daily lives. It has to be a reflection of your lives in the ordinary, boring moments and in the extraordinary moments. What we do here on Sunday has to be a reflection of where your heart is with God and how you're pouring your heart to him during the week, how you're spending time with him. And here's the thing this morning that Without the Monday to Saturday, Sunday morning doesn't happen like it needs to. If you don't know God the rest of the week, I'm sorry, coming to church on Sunday morning is not going to do it for you. If you're not spending time with God the rest of the week, I'm sorry, spending an hour on Sunday morning, spending 20 minutes singing is not going to do it for you to have a thriving and vibrant relationship with him. It's not honoring him. And God doesn't accept it. God longs for people who want to worship him all day, all week. And what we do here on Sunday morning is a reflection of that. And the challenge to even all of us here, to our worship leaders who are leading on on stage every Sunday morning, to us who come up here and speak, to you as a congregation who participates, come with your heart right before God. Come growing in your faith. Come spending time with him. And let Sunday morning, don't let it be the shot in your arm that you need to get you through the week. Make it the celebration of what God has done the week prior and what you know God is going to do in the week ahead. Make it be a celebration of your heart and your relationship with him. You know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wrap up. But I want to ask you this morning, we, thought it, we talked about this idea of worship being an all or none event. I want to leave with one phrase here in regards to that. Are you generous or are you going cheap on God? We look at this idea that worship is what, something that God longs for and that God longs for people who honor him. God designed you to be an instrument of worship to him. He designed you to be a person of worship, to bring honor to him. Are you doing that with your life? We look at this idea that worship is not a meaningless obligation. So why are you here this morning? Are you here because you want to? Or are you here because you have to? 
During the week when you read the Bible, do you do it because you have to? Or do you do it because you believe that God's going to speak to you through this? And that he wants to grow your faith and grow your relationship with him? Do you pray because, well, hey, everybody prays before dinner? Or do you pray because, well, I'm talking to the creator of the universe who wants to talk with me. And I love him. What's your motivation? You see, worship isn't a meaningless obligation. I'm going to call the worship team to come forward and join on the stage here. As they're coming, hear this. That God deserves our heart. And when we don't honor him from our heart, we are actually robbing God from what he deserves. And he deserves honor that comes from hearts fully engaged with him. Hearts that are not obligated to him. True relationship and honor does not come from a place of obligation. It comes from a place of willing obedience and worship. We talk about being a vibrant and moving church here. We want to be an alive church where the Spirit's working in people's lives, where people are coming to Jesus, and where there's a relationship that happens in our worship, where we encounter God weekly. Yet here's the thing. If we want to be that vibrant church when we get together on Sunday mornings and whenever else we get together, if we want to be that alive church, we can't be a dead church the rest of the week. We can't be dead in our personal faith. We can't be dead in seeking out God. If we want this to be a place where vibrancy in life happens as we worship God, where there's relationship and there's honor that happens between us and him, then we can't be a dead church the rest of the week. So i got to ask you this morning, are we worshiping and honoring God from our heart? This morning I want to invite you to return to the heart of worship and to return to him.
this morning, you've heard our God is jealous for us. He longs for us to be with him. How beautiful it is that he sees deep into our heart. And even better, he just didn't leave it at that. Christ came. Christ came to love us. Christ came to redeem us. He sees that heart of ours. He sees our intention. And through it all, he loves us still. He longs for us to come and dwell with him. And say, God, in those moments, I am so sorry my eyes have turned from you. Whether they're in those big things or those little things. The love of God can cover those when we turn to him. Because it's in the presence of Christ we stand. And we can turn to God and say, you are my God. I come, I worship you, and I adore you. I want you to shape who I am. I want to live for you and be redeemed by you and by you alone. And that is the greatness of our God. So don't leave today without turning your heart back to the thing that really, really matters. It's living for God. The way he has loved us and he has created us to be, and that looks different for each of us. May your heart be rich with the love of God as you leave here today. And if it's not, stay a while and set it right with God. Because it's a beautiful place to live when we're in the presence of God. So blessings to you as you go and you live for God this week. Each and every moment is His. Use it in a way that is pleasing and honoring to Him. Amen.